This is Have You Met? My guest today is a passionate lifelong dreamer and certified law of attraction coach. She's been journaling and tracking her dreams since she was a teenager, and she tells us why it's so beneficial to do so. She recently published the book, Dream Tracking, Track Your Dreams and Transform Your Life. Have you met Bambi Corso Steinmeier? So Bambi, how and why and when did you start tracking your dreams? Well, I officially started tracking my dreams when I was about 15. And I had had a dream that kind of sparked this whole big interest in dream work. And I fell asleep in the middle of the afternoon one day and went into this deep, deep sleep and had a dream that when I woke up, I just thought, oh my God, there's so much more to dreaming because there was something about it, Ben, that felt like it, it, it answered some questions about things that I couldn't have possibly figured out in this current life, mm-hmm. so to speak. And so it, that, that got me off and running into doing dream work. And at the time, there was only dream dictionaries. There wasn't a lot of books on dreams. And so it was always reading about other people's ideas of the symbols in your dreams. But as I as time went on and the more that I started researching and studying dreams, the more I started understanding that your dream imagery is really specific to you, the dreamer. So reading about, you know, what the ocean means to somebody else in a dream dictionary might have nothing to do with the ocean for me and my associations with it. So that kind of became the, the tracking idea of learning about our own imagery and how we how we can interact with that in the dream time and the images that we're presented with and so that's it was a long time ago yeah (laughs) it's been over 40 years you know um that i've been working with my dreams yeah wow do you remember like the things in that first dream that you thought that, that made you think that opened your eyes to to whatever else is going on there i i did i wrote the whole dream down at the time And one of the things when I was a child, I was really afraid of fire. And one of the, one of the pieces in the dream was um, it was almost like a past life. If, you know, if you believe in that stuff, it, it was being in a cave and I was watching over a tribe of people and a fire started inside the cave and I was not able to save everybody. And I came back and it was like 200 years later in this mm. same dream. And I was watching modern people walking outside and looking around the cave that had nothing left in it. But there was something about feeling responsible for other people that really resonated with just my own, how, how I am or how I came in and also mm. just why I might have a strong fear of fire. So even if it wasn't a past life dream, there was still pieces of that that I could I could mine for, yeah. you know, for that kind of um, personal reflection and understanding. Wow. Yeah. Whatever it was, it sounds like a fascinating dream either way. Like, uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> very cool. The brain, the brain is very cool. Um, yeah. And so how did you like figure out, how did you go from, okay, you had the dream and you're thinking there's, there's more to that. There's got to be more to that. Where did you go from there? You go start going to the library and getting books straight away. Yes. Is there anyone in your family influencing you as well on this kind of thing? You know, my mom was really into metaphysical studies, not so much dreams, but it was always an open conversation. So, you know, I was very blessed to have a family where there was no taboo subjects as far as, you know, hey, if you're curious about something, Mm. let's figure it out. And um, so, yeah, I did a lot of reading, found every book I could find on dreams, read them all. It took years before I actually found books that resonated more with um my understanding as i was figuring it out over time you know and mm. uh so yeah wow. lots of study but yeah, i love what... reading so that was <laughs> that's know. good it makes it easier yeah. um you said your mom was like really into like metaphysical things what mm. is that exactly can you like expand on that a little bit yeah so i mean she... i have an idea but <laughs> she was an also an avid reader um, and she, she would read things like, um, let me think Ruth Montgomery, who would channel information, uh, some of the Seth material, she had books about that. A lot of it was just power of the mind and, um, how our thoughts are things and how our thoughts manifest our, mm. 
our reality. I, I mean, she went all over the board with her readings, but she was just a really curious person. Mm. And so I think I definitely got some of that by osmosis from her because we were surrounded by it all the time in the house. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And yeah. at that point, so you're 15, you're into all this stuff and you're, you're getting more and more into it. What was your kind of, did you have an idea for your life, how you wanted it to go? Had you thought like what you wanted to do for a career and all that kind of thing? I did. Well, when I was young, I really wanted to be a doctor. And as time went on, that completely evaporated because I didn't like school very much. <laughs> um, so I ended up, I ended up just doing work that just, you know, to survive and, um, that it's been like that, honestly, most of my life, I've always done that, but I've always had things going on on the side. Mm. So, uh, I've been a life coach. I do the dream work and there's, I mean, I've had a, a hundred different types of interests of things that I would do. So yeah. I think I'm still kind of evolving that way because ultimately dream work is where I want to put all my energy. Yeah. Yeah. You did work in the corporate world for a bit though, didn't you? Quite a bit. Yeah. yeah, most of my life. <laughs> it seems like totally like conflicting with the kind of dreams and more spiritual side of life. <laughs> yeah. And you know what's interesting about that, Ben, is, I mean, I think that we think as people that, you know, if, if I'm going to be a spiritual person, I'm going to do dream work or I'm going to do meditation and yoga, that we're following a spiritual path that might be different than the one that we're on if we're also working in a corporate environment and, and having that kind of life, but really there's no separation mm. because everything is about our reaction to whatever it is that we're doing. And everything is an opportunity for us to learn from. So whether it's the people in the yoga class or the people in the office space, there's always going to be that kind of opportunity to, to grow with, with people, right? It's, so yeah, so I used both, you know, and I still kept track of my dreams the whole time. Uh, yeah. Of course, I still do to this day, but the whole time that I was in corporate America, I, that was, that was what sustained me mm. is probably the best way of saying it. Yeah. And so I could go to sleep at night. I could go into the dream world. I could come back with information. I could write things down, but it kept me connected to spirit in yeah. a much stronger way than if I had had nothing to do that. If that was yeah. all that I was doing, right. was just getting up, going to work, getting up, going to work. It would have been very, very different, but the dream work has really, really helped me stay connected to something much bigger. Yeah. Like your anchor during that period. I suppose. Yeah. 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 Do you think all dreams, like every single dream is trying to tell us something or are there some like some, even if it's a minority that are just complete nonsense or just subconscious venting or like just mirroring of the emotions experienced during that day, but with no, you know, deeper meaning. Where do you stand on that? <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think that all dreams are important. I don't know that all dreams necessarily have to be worked. Uh, to your point, I think we're definitely processing stuff at night. Sometimes it might've been, you know, just something that happened during the day and we, we have some dreams and we're working through something and we're figuring it out. Um, I think that they hit us on many levels though, because I think you could still look at any dream and still find some meaning in it if mm -hmm. you did work it. Uh, but I think we, we know when there's been a dream that feels important enough to work it. Like there's something in us that, that, goes oh yeah okay there was that one felt important um those are the yeah. ones that people like, generally will work on yeah the knowing that feeling yeah yeah okay and and can you explain in like a nice concise way dream tracking because that's kind of almost it's, obviously it makes sense as a standalone tracking dreams dream track but you kind of made you kind of came up with the term dream tracking as like a, for your book right the a one word dream tracking mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah so the idea with dream tracking is it's it it is definitely tied to the idea of people who track in nature so the idea is it's all about investigation exploration and discovery as you kind of make the commitment to write down your dreams and then you continue to do so but the the tracks are finding pieces in the dream that you that you can be working with that are going to also help you in your day-to-day -day life. 
So for example, uh, if I have a dream about feeling very anxious about school, maybe, you know, maybe I, I, I'm back in high school and I'm late for a test or, you know, there's some kind of a anxiety feeling going on with that. If I start having dreams that have that emotion of anxiety in them more often, I would consider that a track because it's telling me something about my own inner being that is feeling some sense of anxiety about something, you know? Mm -hmm. So the other pieces in the dream that we start pulling in, you know, who shows up, when does the dream take place? Where does it take place? Um, what are the actions in the dreams? Those become informers that help us to understand what part of our life the dream is really addressing at that moment in time, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So I call them tracks. I, I mean, that's kind of how the idea of dream tracking came up was realizing that the images, it may not be the exact same image that shows up, but it sparks the same memories, emotions, and it, it's, uh, it starts working on us in a different kind of way. And it, it can eat it being the image mm -hmm. starts to evolve over time yeah. sometimes. So as I'm beginning to work on myself, because of something I had in a dream image, that image may change shape it may become smaller, less, less important in the dream as I am growing and evolving and working on myself and, and the images that are accompanying me. Yeah. Would you, would your memory of the dream change? Like, do you think as you work on yourself or would it be, you, are you talking about it? If it's a recurring dream, the image is going to change. No, I just regular dreams. So for, you know, another example. So I remember dreaming uh, years and years ago, I had, uh, a polar bear dream. And I know a lot of people who've had <laughs> bear and polar bear dreams, but in that dream, it was a really, really scary situation. And over time, as I worked on what was happening, that turned into a little white mouse. Now mm -hmm. we're talking 15, 20 years later, but there was a sense given my own work of, of that being connected to a dream so many years before. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. Recurring dreams are a whole nother subject. Yeah. You know, but you still can work with them the same way. Yeah. I suppose that that's just the dream, like screaming at you, the, the, the information. Is, it, is, is that what yeah. you think? It's like Groundhog Day, right? It, it's the Groundhog <laughs> Day of the dream world is the recurring yeah. dream. Yeah. Yeah. So is, is that just yeah when there's i mean i suppose it can be maybe random as well but is it in in a lot of cases is it your subconscious or your dream or whatever whatever force trying to tell you something and trying to insist because you're not picking up on it basically what's really interesting ben is that with recurring dreams generally if i ask somebody when they started and, you know, it could be something that was three months ago, or it could have been 10 years ago, and they're still having the recurring dream. If you can find out when that dream started, generally, there was an event that sparked off of this series of recurring dreams. Um, I remember reading a story about um, a man who started having recurring dreams. And what had happened was his parents got divorced and that's when his dreams started. He hadn't connected it to that, mm, mm, but yeah. he was still working through this many years later in his life. And then when he understood what it was that started the dreams, he was able to then put the energy on that and, and help work through that. And then the recurring dreams stopped. So yeah. it's kind of like this, you know, something is nagging and pulling at your shirt sleeve saying, okay, this is something that is really unresolved. And mm. this really needs some attention. And so it continues to replay and replay and replay until we've done the work. I guess that's a big argument for journaling your dreams then. Because if, yeah, if you don't journal your dreams, you're going to be looking back, having no concept of when you first had a particular dream, I suppose, unless you're very lucky or it happened on like a, a very memorable date. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and also... You know, I talk about the importance of writing some day notes in your dream journal before you go to sleep. And part mm -hmm. of it is for that exact reason, Ben. If I make a few notes about my day, if anything significant happened, it's in my dream journal, it's dated that day. And then I can start seeing the dreams that followed 
the events that are, that were going on within maybe 24, 48 hours of having that particular dream. Yeah. But that gives me a way to go back into the past and see what was going on in my life and see also when similar situations in my life come up in the years to come, do I start having dreams that are similar as well in response? Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. Uh, you're somebody who's journaled loads, right? You journaled your dreams a lot. Um, have you ever noticed, like, this is just a random thought that just popped into my head. Have you ever noticed the pattern in terms of the duration it takes something to, to appear in a dream? Like, do things normally come happen in that day and then you dream about them that night? Or is it maybe potentially more likely you you have something happen in the day and then two days later or four days later or a week later or a month, you know, so on. Have you noticed anything like that? Any patterns like that? I have. I, for me, it's two days. Right. Okay. So I will generally not remember. Well, I'll, I generally won't see a connection to something mm. until two days later. Wow. Okay. I don't know why that is. Maybe it just takes that long to get into our subconscious. I'm not yeah. Sure. Still processing, like downloading. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's really interesting. Um, yeah. So tell me about some of the ways. I know there's loads of ways and it's kind of, yeah, it's, an, it's a difficult question for that reason. But tell me how some of the ways how dreams communicate with us. Oh, gosh. OK. Um, I, so one of the ways that dreams communicate. Well, let me let me back up. If mm -hmm. when we go to sleep, one of the things that happens is the ego is out of the way. And so we're much more open to receiving information, much more open to picking up on energy, much more able to problem solve because the ego's out of the way. And so when we're dreaming, and, and I think there, you know, there's different types of dreams, but when we're dreaming, we're able to kind of download this information in a much more open space where things can, we'll feel them more deeply, um, we can kind of sense into things in a different kind of a way. So they communicate through imagery, which, um, you know, I, th I think that's probably the main piece that people will remember, but also through the emotions that are felt in the dream, they communicate through us. People who don't have eyesight still will dream with all the other senses, you know, and so... Yeah we're always, we're always picking up on things that are happening around us and we're not even conscious of it. So the dreams communicate by tapping into our instincts, our intuition, providing opportunities for us to have synchronicities between something that happened in a dream and then suddenly seeing it the next day in our waking life, uh, kind of tying these two states of being more together. Mm -hmm. you no. Know? Yeah. Wow. Um, what can they do and what can they not do? Like what are dreams capable of? I know in, again, in your book, you mentioned a few things like they, they can warn us and, you know, advise us and all these different kinds of things. So can you expand on that a little bit? Like the, the possibilities with dreams? Oh, there's so <laughs> many possibilities. So one of the, one of the projects I'm working on, which, um, I won't say too much about yet. Cause it's, it's still only a, a thought. One of the things that I started researching years ago was how many amazing inventions, artistic expressions, songs, screenplays, uh, I could go on and on, all came from a dream. So you have everything from Elias Howe, who was the inventor of the sewing machine, who couldn't figure out how to thread the thread the needle, how the needle would work in the sewing machine until he had a very specific dream with a very specific image. And he woke up going, oh my God, that's it. That's, that, wow. solves, that solves it. And he created the sewing machine. There are people who have, um, uh, gosh, what's it called? Like the, the double helix, major chemistry and mathematical and scientific discoveries have come through specifically through dreams where people had a dream and it it either informed them or it answered a question of something they were trying to figure out and now they understood. So it's almost like we're able to tap into this massive universal database of knowledge that we're probably more limited in, in our physical form, 
But in the dream time, again, like we were saying earlier, you're open to all these kinds of things. And there's really nothing that is impossible in a dream. Yeah. I know people who have uh, been healed through dreams, uh, been informed about illness through dreams. Um, there, there are so many examples. So I, if, if you yeah. ask me the simple answer, is there anything that dreams can't do? I, I think it's a pretty big, wide open field. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I think we're just starting to figure that out. I think that, that, that is going to become much bigger as time goes on. Yeah, I think, I think so. I think there needs to be a lot more study and research put into this, this field for sure. Mm -hmm. You mentioned all the great discoveries and stuff that came from dreams. Didn't it wasn't Nikolai Tesla. Didn't he get a lot of his uh, ideas and things from dreams? Did you know? I don't that? know. I, I don't maybe, know. I don't. I may be sprouting uh, awful information here, but I think, I think so. I, maybe not everything, but I'm pretty sure he claimed that a lot of it came from, was kind of given to him in like dreams, basically. Oh, um, yeah. I'm really hoping that checks out uh, right? <laughs> when I Google that after. <laughs> well, I mean, um, even, even a golf professional, uh, you know, Jack, Jack Nicholas developed a golf swing from a dream that he had. And yeah. that worked amazing for him. The Beatles came up with the song yesterday. The Twilight series all came from, you know, inspiration inspired by dreams frankenstein mm -hmm. uh jekyll and hyde the list is so long of the amazing things that have been born of dreams so and imagine how many people don't don't admit it that it's dreams because they want all the credit for their waking their, their waking <laughs> self <laughs> yeah yep. there's a lot um there's a lot. so again you've kind of answered the question already but if you could do it in a nutshell why is dream tracking and paying attention to your dreams so important for, mm. for everyday waking life, you know, for, for somebody. I like the saying, and I hope I get this right. Um, I remember Wayne Dyer saying it, that we are, we are not human beings having a spiritual experience. We are spiritual mm. beings having a human experience. And when you look at life from that perspective, you can see that Dreaming connects us to something so much bigger than ourselves, you know, and our, our bodies, our ego, it, it really opens us up into a different way of even seeing the world, mm -hmm. but it connects us to each other. Uh, it connects us to the natural world, to the animal world and dream work. I mean, there, there's no accident that everybody on the planet dreams, right? We're all born with a heart or, you know, we, we all come in with certain things and dreaming is some part of the human experience. Mm -hmm. So it's obviously part of some kind of a divine design for us to be able to have dreams. And I, I think we have unlimited opportunity to tap into that because yeah. it's a resource that is constantly available to us. And we don't even, we don't even know what opportunities lie there because, you know, we can think of dream work as, okay, well, I'm going to work on myself and I'm having anxiety issues and, you know, and do that. And that yeah. is true. But also there is, there's a space in dream work where, everything is unlimited. And so from there, we can also pull in information about things that we've never thought about doing or things that we had an interest in that we didn't even realize or, you know, so something outside of us. And so I, you know, I always joke with, with my friends, I can't wait to go to sleep at night because I can't wait to see what I'm going to dream. And that part of dream work to me makes it, 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 it keeps me connected to the inner child you know, yeah. to that part of us, that's always so awestruck and so interested and, oh my gosh, you know, look what I undug this morning, mom, you know, and, and we find these, these gems in our dreams. And if we weren't paying attention to them, I think we miss some of the magic of life yeah. and some of the mystery, you know, like there's a place of miracles and that's part, partly there too, you know, mm. 
that's interesting because i was going to ask you about that as well um the that kind of childlike magic yeah you know when you're a child and everything feels feels new and amazing and exciting and and i think everybody kind of sometimes misses that that feeling um and and i was going to ask you about yeah how dreams can can reconnect us with that inner child uh, within us but yeah you kind of answered it there so um that's definitely a big argument to to dream and track <laughs> dreams <laughs> well and and you know another piece of that too is dreams is, somehow they they inspire a creative response sometimes so i know a lot of people who will draw their dream and i'm not talking you know great artistic manifestations i mean just you know you just draw something from the dream or you write a poem based on the dream you you tap into just anything creative that it inspires you to do. You know, maybe you dreamt about a, a potato and you start cooking the next day, but all of those kinds of things, when you're paying attention to your dreams, help you to reconnect also to that, to that inner child that likes to draw and to play and, you know, to dance. And so, yeah. yeah. So it's good to 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 be creative with how you yeah express it I suppose and and how oh, you keep yeah. track of it yeah absolutely yeah can you talk a little bit about precognitive dreams and a bit about your experience your direct experience with you know how it foretold your kind of your breast cancer mm, that you ended yeah. up getting um you can talk in general about precognitive but I I do want to hear that that kind of story and, and okay the, yeah yeah um so. So first, just to the to the pre precognitive yeah. part of dreams, mm -hmm. people are constantly again receiving information from from their dreams and are always picking up on things from the future, and they may not be specific though. I, you know, there's been plenty plenty of times that that they are. Um, Actually, there, I have one. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna divert to precognitive because it has to do with my mom. Mm -hmm. and this is such an amazing story. Um, she was a dancer, and when she was uh, 16 or 17 years old, she was preparing for a contest in a few weeks, and she remembered waking up um, from a dream where mm -hmm. it was a very upsetting dream. And there was a woman who was yelling in the dream and, but everything was really, really dark. And she kept, the woman kept yelling about her legs, her legs. And my mom didn't give any thought to it until two weeks later. Um, she was late to the dance rehearsal and she was in a car with eight other people and they were driving really fast to get there. And somebody in another car coming the other direction, swung out behind a semi truck and hit them head on. And many people in the car died. And my mom doesn't remember hardly anything from that event, except that she heard the same woman who was sitting in the front seat yelling about her legs. And, you know, you have to wonder mm. about things that are you know, you, you, I don't know. I, it, it's hard to know, you know, are things destined to happen? Do, are we just picking up on something that's already in the works? You know, that, those are some of the big, great questions that, that I certainly don't have the answer to, but I do know that in dreams, we are receiving information about the future. And especially if you get into uh, like, what is it the string theory where there's all these levels happening at the same time in life. So there really isn't a past, present and a future. They're all happening at the same time mm. in theory. Um, so, but for myself, yeah, I had, um, I had a really short dream that I was in a staircase and I ran into my doctor in the staircase and he told me I had breast cancer and, or, or that I was going to get breast cancer. And when I woke up from the dream, I was really worried about it because number one, it was so specific. Number two, it was a fear just in general. And number three, because kind of to the point I was making earlier about there's some part of us that just knows something about a dream. When you have it, you go, Oh yeah, man, <laughs> hmm. 
I had a feeling about that one and I knew it had something to do with my ability to express myself. And so, you know, I wrote the dream down years went by. I kept trying to work on this area of my own life. And then I ended up um, being diagnosed with breast cancer. And, you know, I kind of, in the book, I write about it, that I was, you know, it was almost like this embarrassing moment of crap. I didn't, I didn't get it or I didn't do it. And even though I'm, you know, doing the work and I'm trying so hard, I still didn't get where I wanted to get. Mm -hmm. Thank goodness. I still have the rest of my life to, (laughs) to work on this, you know, but there was a knowing and, and if I had been able to maybe work on that part of myself that really, you know, it, 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 there are certain things I think that are just lifelong challenges that we come in with and we go out with and, you know, but who knows? I don't know, but there was some part of that that was preparing me to, to go through that. Yeah. That's amazing. I mean, both of those anecdotes are amazing. Um, Precognitive dreams is a weird one, isn't it? It's like, uh, it's harder to get your head around than like, it's easy to to understand. Like, okay, so my dream is is processing all the things that have happened to me and it's telling me that I should do this or I should look at that or it's presenting new options to me based on what my, yeah, my, my neutral self likes or dislikes. And that's kind of okay. So the brain's amazing. and But then the precognitive thing is, is it's different, isn't it? Like, um, where do you think the information, obviously it's just pure speculation, I know, because we don't know, but where do you think like the information in dreams comes from? Do you think it's a version of like yourself that just has access to every single memory, every single thing you've experienced, um, and has, you know, any, any, is it a shared consciousness? Is there, do you think it's coming from somewhere else, somewhere external? What are your thoughts and feelings? Ooh, that's a big question. Yeah, I mean, it's not really a question. I think, <laughs> I think that one has a lot of answers because yeah. I do think it is part of, you know, there's the collective, right? The whole collective mindset on the planet. Mm-hmm. There are, it is the memories, right? We've all, we've all have a lifetime of, of all of this type of, you know, I- incredible experiences and, and memory. I think also cellularly that, you know, we're being informed by, I mean, the cells in the body, the body itself functions even without our own conscious awareness of it, right? Like, I don't know what my liver is doing right now, but it has a mind of its own and it's doing what it needs to do. And so there's a, there's a body intelligence also where all the cells and everything is working together and it's doing its thing. And it also has the ability to inform us when we're paying attention, um, you know, whether it's in waking life or in dreams, um, and I do think there is, you know, there is some mass consciousness somewhere that we do tap, tap into. So mm-hmm. I think we're getting informed by a lot of things. I think we're also very much informed by the natural world. Um, I think there are energies that are always going on around us. And that's why really tapping into and tuning into our own senses and our instincts and intuition plays a huge part, not just in dream work, just in our waking life, right? When we're paying attention to stuff like that, we're also able to pick up on energies that are happening around us that, you know, can help us. They can not help us. I mean, but almost like the precognitive stuff, if you have that sense of danger and all of a sudden you feel your body respond by walking past someone and the hair goes up on your arm, there's a some part right that is mm-hmm. that is sensing something yeah and we learn yeah. to follow that and go okay yeah I'll move away Let's go somewhere else yeah it's amazing i think it's all connected to like this big unknown that there's yeah. so many things we don't know and it's just it's it's fascinating oh it's, um yeah you mentioned as well about healing in dreams and you said you i don't know if you've ever experienced it directly but you said you know a few people that have told you about healing in dreams what are your what are your experiences or knowledge of that? Um, the the well, there's a wonderful lady uh, named uh, Kathleen O'Keefe, and she has some books out, and she talks about this. She's a lucid dreamer, and I know mm-hmm. you are really interested in that subject too. Um, but she she in lucid dreaming, I guess it's different, and and this is definitely not my area of expertise. But there's 
I just remember that her story, um, she also went through breast cancer, had to do with meeting people in the dream time who helped her. Yeah. So, you know, sometimes right. I think that they will come to us with maybe specifics or maybe, you know, I mean, it, I think it's so different for different people, right? We all hear or receive information differently. And, yeah. but again, if you weren't writing them down, you wouldn't necessarily remember that you had just received this massive gem in the dream time to help. Yeah. 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 True. Um, okay. So lucid dreaming. So you touched on lucid dreaming. I did want to ask you a little bit about that today. I know that's not your specialism or anything like that, but I wanted to know how often do you lucid dream? Hardly ever. Hardly ever. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's Is funny. That, <laughs> I was going to, is there a reason? Like, is it because do you prefer to let the dream kind of have control and show you what it wants to show you rather than having any involvement? Or is it just, you're just not in the habit? I think more I'm not in the habit, but I'm, I'm, because I, there is such a massive benefit to lucid dreaming. Uh, but mm -hmm. I, it's, you know, it's another commitment also. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I haven't, I, I've had them. Uh, and it's always amazing just to have the experience of waking up in a dream. But I think for me, I haven't put enough time and energy yet into into doing that as a constant, yeah. you know. It's a whole other can of worms, isn't it? it is. When you when you start making your decisions and your dreams and things like that as well, that's uh, yeah, that would make yeah. it more challenging to track. I think maybe I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> more things to write down at least. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, any advice you can give for like just general advice for like dream recall? First of all. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, generally it's all, it's a couple little things. I'll just do like, I don't know, three or four of them. Sure. One of them is if, well, first of all, if you're not a dreamer and you're interested in starting to um, have recall and start writing them down, start reading about dreams and the reason, what, or, you know, watch a documentary, do something where you're watching or reading studying something about dreams because it starts it starts activating that part of yourself uh unconsciously so mm -hmm. you're you're all, you're starting to intention set to start remembering so that would yeah. be one thing um maybe go back to a previous dream that you had and it could be 20 years ago and reread an old dream because it still has that same type of effect where you're you're getting back into a dream space, you know, you could even rewrite the dream again, even if it's already written. And, and just because it starts getting um, the hands involved. And for some reason, it, you know, and I type my dreams after I've written them, but I try to always handwrite them first, because for, for me, it, it just, I don't know, there's something about writing them down that helps me with my dream recall in the future. So um, keeping track of it, just anything you dream, even if it seems really, really silly or small, write down anything. It might yeah. be that, you know, I just dreamt of a dog, you know, but okay. But was it a, a, a red dog or, you know, was it a black dog? Do you know it was male? Like there's a lot of information you can gain, even if you think it's just one little image, you know, where yeah. was the dog? How, what was the dog's disposition? You know, is it happy? Was it not happy? So starting to look at the details, even on the tiniest pieces of dream, of dream imagery also helps to kind of open up that, that recall. So it's kind of like building a muscle. You go to the gym, right? And you, you know, you do some bicep curls. It's, it's developing this type of a dream muscle by, you just keep doing it a little bit, a little bit, a little bit. Yeah just making it a habit yeah yeah and what about any uh, just little little tidbits of advice for tracking dreams or dream tracking alternatively? Ooh. well journaling about... i suppose as well you could call it journaling i, I guess i'm kind of mixing the terms a little bit um <laughs> <laughs> yeah. that's okay it's all related anyway yeah uh so on journaling a couple things uh the first one we talked about a little bit which is the day notes so well, actually, let's start. Let's start first with just keep an open notebook and a pen next to your bed and just have it there, have it ready, have it already opened up to a blank page, because that's also unconsciously setting an intention 
that you're going to remember your dreams and make a couple notes about your day. And, you know, maybe it's just that, Hey, I had lunch with a friend and, you know, it was great. Maybe it's, I, you know, had a fight with my boss, whatever, anything that kind of stands out or just, just something that will remind you about what you did that day. But specifically, if there was anything out of the ordinary or something that really sparked a strong emotion, put that in there. And I'm talking about three sentences that not a big thing. It's not this massive commitment or time consuming thing. Just write a few notes about the day. Mm -hmm. And then whatever you remember in the morning, write it down. And like I said, it might be a couple of words only, but one, one really simple and key trick to journaling is to write your dream in the present tense, because for, you know, we, we seem to think when we wake up that the dream was in the past. I mean, you know, it was, we just had it last night or this morning, but if we write the dream out in the present tense, so, so I'll give you an example. Uh, so if I'm writing it down the past, so let's say I had this dream and in the dream, I was in this jail cell and, you know, it was underground and it was dark and it was cold and I was by myself. And if I write it in the present tense, I am in a jail cell, it's underground, it's dark, it's cold, I'm lonely. Um, it, it, it brings the dream into the immediacy of the moment. So, you know, if I look at I was in jail, it's very different than saying I am in jail, because I just from that piece, that one little shift to the present tense might immediately tell me something about why this dream is happening right now. You know, what, how am I feeling in jail? How am I, you know, experiencing being kind of caged up in my life or in my job or, you know, so present tense. Yeah. A good, it's just a good way to, to get into writing down the dreams. Um, and other journaling, gosh, I, I mean, those would be the, the main first, just right off the top. Yeah. Yeah. What about tracking? Any other little things that you haven't mentioned in, for, for kind of looking for the tracks and keeping an eye out for the things to, to notice, you know? Yes. So because as you're journaling the dreams, what you'll begin to notice is, oh gosh, I remember dreaming about that mouse a couple of days ago, or I, you know, I keep dreaming about, you know, whatever, whatever mm -hmm. it is. As you're writing them down, all of a sudden you start realizing or, or noticing that there was a similar image perhaps. And so when I'm writing down my dreams and I'm trying to do any kind of tracking and I have a memory about a dream that I wrote down a few days ago, I'll just make a little note. You know, this, this image is the exact same shape as the image was, you know, on November 7th, whatever. And so I start tying pieces together any place where they start matching. And, and the longer I've been doing it, tracking, the more often I'm seeing how often similar imagery is appearing. Um, it started happening a couple months ago. I, I kept dreaming about and continue to keep dreaming about gold. And that's not an image that I remember from my past. I don't remember, you know, having dreams about that, but it keeps showing up in these different scenarios in my dreams. So in the tracking sense of it, I'm, I keep a, like a little, uh, a little sheet where I will list specific images that are, that are showing back up again and the dates that I had them. Cause especially if I want to pull them all together and read them all together and see what that looks like. Um, it's just easier to find them, but there's, um, that's part of, part of the tracking is just noticing where, where things are running in. And yeah. then the other part too, is, is just even in those day notes where, how was I feeling that day? And then how are my dreams responding after, after that event and tracking the dream imagery to waking life events or waking life emotions. Another way is the, the simple uh, dream, dream work piece of associations. And that is always so helpful. Uh, 
in my book, I have what's called the dream tracking tree. And it really is just an associative process to a dream image. And the idea is just to write, you know, if, if there's a main image in your dream or there's a few of them, you, it's kind of like mind mapping. And here, I'll, I have a picture. This is, this here is ah, the dream tracking tree. But you, I put the, the image in the knot of the tree and then just in the branches, I just start writing all my associations to that image. And it's amazing what kind of stuff comes up when you really start thinking about something, you know, all these different pieces. And then underground, I have roots and I put the emotions there because that also tells me, okay, what is, what is feeding this type of an image and how can I track that back again to something that's happening in my own life right now? So the emotions are kind of setting that underground stage of, okay, what's showing up above ground, you know? Yeah. Great stuff. Yeah. Um, I feel like dream tracking is something and journaling and just analyzing is something you could spend like infinite time on. Mm -hmm. So how, how, how long do you spend like approximately per day on working on your dreams and noting them and, and just thinking about them, mulling on them, all that kind of thing? Good question. Um, yes. Cause you're right. It, it can be really, really time consuming. You could do it mm. every day. Seems like but, a job that has one, like a, like a piece of string, you know, no, no finish. You could do it literally. You could go on every, into more and more levels and more and more depth and yeah. you could look at it different ways and you could just spend 24 hours on each dream. Easily. Yeah. <laughs> but it's like anything else, right? You have to create also some space from it. Um, yeah. I, my main commitment is writing down anything I remember. So mm -hmm. when I get up in the morning and that's part of, you know, I, I get up a little extra early to allow myself a little extra time so that I can have a cup of coffee and write down whatever dreams that I remember, if I remember them. So writing and writing them down for me is always the most important part of it. If I have time um, to work on it later than I do, or I'll sit and do, you know, write a poem about it, do a little drawing, or maybe just draw one piece of, of, of the dream. But I try to do something uh, to keep it in my memory during the day. Not that I'm obsessing about the dream, but it's like, gosh, it's so interesting that, you know, an elephant keeps showing up or what, you know, something. So uh, for, for myself, I do things that keep the images in my consciousness, even though I may not actively been, be working on them. So that's one thing. Uh, I, I mean, I probably spend about an hour a day personally on my own dreams. Mm -hmm. Not always, uh, but, you know, but then I also sometimes will have an opportunity to work with another dream worker and we will actually will work a dream for a couple of hours on a weekend or, yeah. you know, wow. but I think it's individual. Yeah. And I guess it's way more important than, for example, I think it's way more important to have two to five minutes consistently every day of scribbling some notes down rather than, you know, three hours once a month, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Because again, it's that consistency and <laughs> consistency. You're, you know, you're developing that kind of memory and attention to detail mm -hmm. in the dream. Yeah. 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 So I, if you're comfortable to talk about a few of your own dream experiences, there were a few that kind of piqued my interest in your book. And just, I just wanted to generally ask if you've got any other really memorable sure. ones. I'll let you know the ones that, that I came across. And if you want to go into detail on any of them, you can. And if not, okay. if there's anything else you want to talk about, you can. Um, but there was one where you had, I think you kind of touched on it earlier with that you came face to face with a bear. I don't know if that's due to the, with the same uh, sequence of dreams or not. Mm. Um, another one, you died in your dream. Mm -hmm. and another one you got pulled up into the galaxy and so i wanted to yeah hear a bit more about those <laughs> and just if there's any others that that you wanted to share oh gosh so the so the galaxy dream was the same dream as dying and gosh that was so long okay. ago um but i i remember literally dying in the dream and then having this sensation of getting like sucked up and out of my body and out into the galaxy and you know i had always read that if you die in your dream you actually die mm. but i don't really know how anybody would know that because they couldn't come <laughs> back and report it if that were the case yeah. so you know <laughs> yeah. and i know other people who have died in their dreams too so uh how yeah. did that feel though when like and how how if it's not too personal to ask how you died in your dream I um <laughs> I don't remember how I, I would have to look that one up. Um, the bear. 
<laughs> no, I've had talking bears though. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Just before we go into the bears, just the, the, the dying in the dream again. Yeah. Did you feel any kind of, again, not physical because you're, you're asleep, but in your dream, did you feel any like pain or any sensations or anything like that? I remember feeling kind of that great sense of peace that people report who have like died and come back to life. Mm -hmm. it, there was something really fascinating and amazing. It was like this overwhelming feeling, but it was a good feeling. There was yeah. nothing about it that was bad. And yeah. this ability to fly through space at like the speed of light or whatever it was, was all just as fascinating. Yeah. So, and your memory of that, were you like passing by like planets and stuff and getting a good view? Or was it kind of like an old Windows 93, like screensaver with like little stars uh, moving around in the background? I don't remember going past planets, but I remember just going up into a galaxy, you know, the dark night and into yeah. the, you know, the shining stars everywhere kind of a galaxy. Wow. Yeah. yeah. That's an amazing dream. So go on then the bears. Tell me about some of these bears. Oh, gosh. I've been dreaming about bears, actually. They're one of my childhood dream images that has accompanied me my entire life. Wow. I haven't had one in a while, which is really interesting. But some of the very first dreams that I have in my journal, even from before I was 15, I think I had made a few notes on some other ones, bears were there. And, the, you know, brown bears or black bears. Um, there's there's something about the the energy of bear obviously that that i resonate with mm -hmm. so generally in those dreams they're not always there's always some sense of distance between you know or keeping a distance i mean i think the natural instinct is to be a little concerned about getting too close to bears wild bears mm -hmm. and it's that way in the dreams but I've, I've also had dreams where I was, you know, underground talking to a family of bears and um, yeah. So, I mean, these are the pieces where you never really interpret a dream as a final interpretation, mm -hmm. which is why I, I try to keep it open and more like, okay, I'm going to track my dreams instead of interpret them, even though I'm going to gain and, and gather information from the dream because it's always evolving and it's always changing. So, you know, what the bear meant to me as a child, you know, when, when we're dreaming of monsters might have been very different and surely would have been then now in my life, it would, mm -hmm. you know, there's just such different dynamics and there's all these years in between of understanding life in a different kind of a way. Yeah. But yeah, that's definitely one of my, one of my animals. <laughs> yeah. You've got others, right? You've got the owl and the hawk as well. Uh huh. Got the yeah. owl and the hawk. Do they all bring to you something different in your dreams? Like, is it is bear, owl, and hawk? Are they are they completely different characteristics and things like that? Or is am I on the right track at all? Or is that yeah, they, just... they, they are. They're completely different. Mm. Um, yeah, I, I mean, they're such just like in waking life, the energies of the of dream animals, and I'll kind of just generalize this a little bit is yeah. so different because there is a huge difference between a bear and an owl in every way. Right. I mean, one's yeah. a land animal, one's a, a, a more of an air animal. And I mean, size, what they do, uh, how, how they live, how they breed, everything is so different, which is one of the reasons why paying really close attention to animals and dreams is so helpful because you want to get to understand and know the animal in the dream for many reasons. Yeah. Um, and so often they're coming to us to speak to us about our own instinct, our own intuition. Um, and, and sometimes, you know, sometimes it's not even about us. And though this, this might be a bit of a jump, but we do pick up on the things that are happening in the outer world. You know, mm, I think I, I know where you're going dream. here. Yeah, I actually wrote down this quote from your book. If you let me jump in, I'll read it now. Yes, and you and I was going to ask you if you could expand on it, and so okay. I think you're about to do that. So let me just quickly <laughs> slide in there before you do. Um, so yeah, this is from your book. So our planet is polluted. 
the air, the water, the land, even the atmosphere. We give more attention to something, how something is marketed than we do to where the packaging ends up or how it got there. Creatures that have roamed the earth for centuries are going extinct by the day. Rainforest, the lungs of the earth are being replaced by pastures and the oceans have become dumping grounds. It's endless and it can be overwhelming. And that just resonated with me so much when I read it and I just thought it was a really, really cool quote. And I think, uh, yeah, I wanted to hear more about your thoughts on how that relates to people and, and dream work or when you're awake and just in general. Yeah, oh, it's a good so, question. Um, and it's a hard one. Um, because there's a lot going on. Yeah. You know, there's always a lot going on. Mm. Um, but we're in a different time right now on the planet. And because we are, well, I, be, I believe, and I, I, would, I would jump to say that, I, you know, anybody who is trying to do spiritual work would agree that we are all connected. We're all made up of the same stuff you know, the, the molecules and the atoms, we all share a certain type of DNA, shall we say, right? Not the exact, but because we're all connected there, things that happen someplace else can't not affect us, even if we're completely unconscious about them. And this kind of gets to that, that idea of a collective consciousness or, you know, uh, what, ha what happens, you know, on here affects what happens here. Everything, there's different plates going on around the world. And I think, you know, obviously awareness around that is raising, but I think people are also feeling it and seeing it in their dreams. We're picking up on things in the dream time that we may not even completely understand or know about. Um, mm. I dream, I have been dreaming for years of just picking up trash. It's a simple, silly kind of a dream. And yet it's not because if I feel like if I really, really work on the, the idea of that image, how am I going to be part of the cleanup? How do I help pick up the mess? How do I help heal? You know? So I think in the dreams we're, we're being informed by nature and the plight of nature. And as human beings, we have that ability to do something about it. And I mean, that's a huge blessing. Our, our animals, not they don't have that ability this way, mm. you know? I'm praying, of course, that they will all <laughs> repopulate and, and survive, but it's up to the human beings who can do a, make a conscious effort to, to fix something that are getting informed by the out, outer world yeah. of what needs help. And I think we're all called to do something different. And it doesn't have to be something big. It might just be picking up the trash on my block. You know, mm -hmm. it might just be, you know, uh, helping to feed some, some shelter animal. It doesn't matter, you know, spending time, you know, teaching children about the importance of, of the planet or, you know, yeah. there's so many ways of doing it, but I'm just saying, I guess that the, the dreams were being informed by the planet in the dreams as well uh, to what it needs yeah you know? mother nature or the universe or whoever somebody something yeah trying to pass a message that we're not doing good stuff here right, right now we need to look after it. how do you stop yourself being like i mean this is the same for everybody i mean depending on how aware people are and how much they look into it i mean you clearly are quite aware of what's going on on the planet so how do you stop yourself like basically being down about it and and depressed for want of a better word like how do you stay positive and just keep trying to make uh, you know the little difference that you can make um when like you say it's just like i was looking back at the quote it just it's affecting so many levels and even in the quote you know like you, you can even go way beyond that right and and where you say like pastures are replacing the amazon yeah they are and then they're being like flooded with pesticides that then go into the ground and into the water and it's just on every level it feels like and it is overwhelming so how do you how do you keep it in check and that's another great question. And, and, you know, to be totally honest, I don't always keep it in check. You know, I have, mm. it's really hard. Um, it's really hard. It's a painful, it's painful to see it happening and it's painful to feel helpless in not yeah. knowing how to, because there's so much that needs to be done. Um, 
I do rely on, you know, my, my belief that's in, in a bigger power that, that enough people are going to be touched that will help bring about a shift in consciousness because so much of what's going on on the planet is the way that we think about it. Mm. You know, it, it's not that we reign over nature and animals. It's that we exist, we coexist with them. And how do, mm. how do we find ways of sustaining each other, you know, yeah. that works, but, but it's going to take a lot of effort. And I think the way of not getting overwhelmed and I, and I don't know that this is a hundred percent Ben, because again, I get very overwhelmed. It, it hurts. I like, I can feel it physically in my body, the stuff that is going on. Um, but I just either one, try to just, again, just do something on your street, find, find a way where you're giving back. Um, it's like being of, of service to somebody else help helps pull us out of our own grief. So my service might also be, you know, to the trees by planting some more trees, or it may be, uh, you know, doing something to help some kind of, you know, anim animals that are in need or whatever. I just, I try to do something for the others to get it so that I've done something. Yeah. Um, I guess it, that's the most important thing is just to do your, just to do something. So you do your part, whatever your part is. If you're like a, if somebody watching here is like a politician or, or an influential business person, then it's on you. You got to do something big, but, but us, the normal people, I think, yeah, it's important to just do your little bit and try and be conscious of it and bring awareness of it to people around you. Um, and yeah, just, I guess, trying to limit, like you say in your, in your quote from the book, the, the packaging. Mm -hmm. I'd, I'd, we give a lot of thought to that now, me and my, my partner, but I don't think a lot of people do give thought to that, to packaging. And I'm speaking of close friends, of family. Mm -hmm. People don't really give thought to it, to how much plastic is, is being used just to package this product, if it's single use or not, where the different parts of this this product or food come from in the world. Like they're mm -hmm. being, you know, just to, for example, like to get a little fruit salad in a, in a plastic pot, you might be having like fruits from Brazil, from Costa Rica, from, you know, China, wherever, just Africa, all over the world. And you just, you have to think about then the, the, the fact that that's having to be transported and it's having to be grown, which takes loads of water. And it's probably having, <laughs> I'm rambling now, but yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> It's but it, it is right. I mean, it's all part of this bigger thing that's that's going on. And I think becoming us becoming conscious of our own actions and also the ripple effect of our actions. Like I wash Ziploc bags. Sometimes yeah. you just have to use Ziploc bags, but I reuse mine and I we reuse do too. Them. <laughs> I hate washing them. I hate it so much. My girlfriend makes me do it. I hate washing them. I'm like, oh, really? Yeah, yeah. But I know it's good. And we do. Yeah, right. <laughs> But, but many people don't. And, you know, yeah. so I'm like, okay, it seems silly. It might just be one little thing that I do, but okay, that, all right. You know, I recycle my egg containers. It's just about bringing consciousness to, to literally what our effect is. And, yeah. but it, I spent, well, there's something, and, and I'll touch on this. I, in my book, I talk about something called dream inspired advocacy. Uh, it started because of my dreams of the owls and, mm -hmm. and it, it has evolved, but I originally, um, after having dreams of owls for 20 years and started under, you know, getting really interested in them and understanding them, uh, started in an owl box group, put up an owl box. My husband and I have a, an owl box. Um, and it was just a next And I don't know if, if that's where you are, if you guys have that, but you, it's a neighborhood community online. Mm -hmm. Well, I have now over 400 people on that group interested in owls and owl boxes, but what evolved out of that? And, and this, I think is the piece that's so interesting that taps into what you were saying. What I learned that I didn't know was that owls as well as gosh, you know, hawks, eagles, coyotes, bobcats um, are being poisoned by rodenticides. And it, it wasn't on my radar. I didn't know about it until I started this owl box group. And then I started, you know, sharing information and realizing that, oh my gosh, you know, you have to actually make sure that 
within a mile radius, nobody is using poison, rat poison, because then, mm. you know, the owl eats the rat and then the owl and the owl family can, you know, can die from one poisoned rat. But it turned into this whole other thing, um, which is that after a year and a half of having the owl box group, um, I met up with another woman. We had a similar experience of finding an animal on our property who had uh, died and been poisoned, two different instances. And we decided to put together a grassroots group called Poison Free Caneo Valley. And so in our community, we're just out there spreading the word about not using rodenticides because yes, it's getting in the water, like you said, um, but more so it's going right up the food chain. Uh, mm. You know, you, so, you, so I, I feel like because of the dreams originally, this is kind of what I was saying where, you know, you don't always know what the pull of the dream is and, and you don't really know where you're going to end up, but if you're paying attention and you're, you know, just kind of following along a little bit and let, allow yourself to be led somehow by, by the dreams, other stuff shows up and this has definitely become one of them. And so we've become these advocates of, of teaching people about not using rodenticides in our area. Is it going to change the planet? Don't know. I hope so. <laughs> but you know, you, you start small because it's so yeah. big. Everything is so big right now. Um, and yes, I wish there were politicians and, and Monsanto, you know, people who had the ability to, to make some serious change, but you know, they dream too. And I imagine that if they were to start paying better attention, even to their own inner life, that these kinds of things would become more conscious for them. So that's what I, I hold out for and hope for yeah. that. For some you know. recurring nightmares to, to people <laughs> that, that need them. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, can't give up yeah. hope. <laughs> no, I can join you on hoping for that for sure. Um, <laughs> so I, I, to change the kind of change the the angle a little bit here and uh, and move on from from that yeah depressing but but very <laughs> relevant topic of of the planet, the life on on the planet. Um, I got a really random question, and I'm probably going to butcher how I actually ask this because it's really kind of it's confusing to even put it into words. But have you ever come across an instance of two or more people sharing a dream? So I mean, I'm talking about two people or, or more that are both asleep at the same time, and they so I fall asleep and I see this person in my dream, and then they're asleep, but they see me, and we go and have some fun activities in the dream. But then they wake up and they're like, "Did you?" And they're yeah no way and is that have you ever come across that or is that just fantasy <laughs> no i've heard of it it hasn't happened to me directly uh yeah. i remember marion woodman responding to that same question in a, a tape she did and her and her husband for example both uh dreamed they were in china or one of them dreamed they were in china the other one dreamed of china it's a little different than yours um mm -hmm. i would venture to say that sounds kind of like astral traveling Dreaming? I've heard of that. Yeah. Uh, so you're still kind of out of the body, but interacting. So, mm. yeah. <laughs> Very interesting. And, and that astral projection thing, do you know much about that, that astral stuff? I don't know a lot about it. I, yeah. I saw my mother uh, once as a, I was a child and I saw her in the middle of the night, uh, astral traveling. She walked through one wall and into another and I ran to her bedroom and woke her up and I said, what were you doing over there? She goes, what are you talking about? I said, mom, I just saw you in your nightgown. You just walked through the wall. And she said, no, I've been laying here sleeping. And so, um, so I'm very open to all that stuff because I really do believe there's so much more to life that's going on mm. than, than we even have any concept of. Yeah. Yeah. I want to get into some of that stuff in a minute, but before we do, I, I just wanted to, I, I was thinking about asking you earlier in our conversation, but I did want to touch on it at some point is the law of attraction. Cause you're a, like a certified coach of this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted, if you could like kind of give a definition of what it is and just how it applies to, to dreams and how it can apply to living, a, a, I guess, a happy, healthy life um, or okay. just anything you want to say about it. But I just wanted to touch on it. Oh yeah. Well, and that's, it's such a huge subject and I'll try to keep it kind of just mm, yeah. condensed. <laughs> but the basics, so the law of attraction is it's a universal law and it basically means that, um, you know, to, to, there's an, there's a, a cause and an effect to everything 
Okay, I'm going to butcher this. We're going to have to fix this piece, Ben. Um, <laughs> no worries. It's like what what I what you think about expands. So the law of attraction will state that if you know if if I'm in a really good mood, and and the example I like to use is okay when you fall in love, right? Everything is great. Everything mm-hmm. around you is great. Everything that you see is great. You're like it's six months of bliss. And then it, because you're drawing the same energy to you, right? So if I'm in love, I'm, you start pulling, it just, it, it's kind of, it's that law of, of manifesting that, that what you think about expands. So you're drawing more of that to you mm-hmm. versus the opposite where, you know, you're going through a breakup and life is just falling apart everywhere around yeah. you, you know? So it's like you, you can kind of, you see your inner self in your outer experience um i know that's not really explaining it the law of attraction as well but i see what you're saying you're saying like if you're feeling good and and so you it by by you know due to that you're putting good out there you're in a good mood you're being nice to people you're smiling and you're, you're that kind of positivity and so it comes back to you is that that's the kind of thing yeah and if you're negative then you're a bit more snappy with people and you're giving them a funny look and so they're horrible to you and everything feels you know everything spirals right you know, is that, that's <laughs> it is more of an energetic right so it's kind of like you're broadcasting your energy out into the world and you're seeing it reflected by what's coming back Mm-hmm. Um, in dream work, I like to use, I like to always at least apply it to see if there is information for the dreamer about how they, what they may be broadcasting, broadcasting, what they are putting out into the world. And if, if it part of what it, it may be going on is, you know, they have a, a thought or a belief system that they are stuck on but it's also keeping them from opening up and allowing something else to happen because they'll only see something one way or um you know like the law of attraction kind of in a general way is really looking at your own patterns and beliefs um because things again that we think about they expand so yeah it's a big subject (laughs) Yeah, I bet. Um, so you said in your book that as a child, you used to have dreams of trying to photograph UFOs. Um, and that caught my attention. And so I had to ask about that. I had to ask if you know why and if you ever have seen a UFO. Yeah. <laughs> so, oh God, it's so funny. So that's another one. I mean, I've had that dream for years and way early on in childhood. So I mentioned, you know, we, my family had very open mind about things. And so UFOs were one of the conversations in the house, not all the time, of course, but, you know, curiosity, right. And we would talk about stuff and we would read books. You know, I think the blue book was out back then. And so I was fascinated with them, but yeah, I started dreaming about UFOs. And then this is back in the day before there were, uh, iPhone cameras and Mm. cell phone cameras. So, you know, in the dream, I'm always trying to take a picture. I see something in the night sky. I try to take a picture of the UFO and I could never take the picture. Right. It's kind of, you know, it, it's one of those dreams, you know, it's like, you know, people have, you know, something to protect themselves and it falls apart in their hands or, you know, Mm. something's not working. Um, but I, I did when I was about 16 years old, I did see a UFO and it was late at night. And I was uh, up on a hill with a girlfriend. We were just listening to Bob Seger, actually. And there was this light just jumping around across the way uh, out here, kind of where I live uh, over what's called Lake Sherwood. Uh, And so we watched this and then, and it was so fascinating and so bizarre. And we started driving out of the area and then, you know, so it flies, it went over the car and disappeared. So we never actually got to see it close up, but except for, you know, the light bouncing around and then just mm. this shadow of it going over the car. So, wow. um, yeah, but it was cool. And yeah, that sounds cool. <laughs> so you saw the light bouncing around. How far away were you like roughly from, from where the light was? I'm thinking maybe two miles. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. I mean, it wasn't far away. Yeah. Um, and, 
and the movements was it like really like how how was it moving exactly yeah i mean so it's it was just like it kind of like this triangle like it just kept doing this kind of a thing and moving around and then it would stop and then it would do it again i mean there was just no way that it was anything else um you say it was over a lake um no it, well yes yeah, sort of it's called in an area called lake sherwood but it was over oh, okay. there was a hill and mm. it was we could see this above the hill in the night sky doing wow. its thing yeah so um and yeah, when it fast. flew over the car you said you saw like the kind of shadowy mm -hmm. outline rather yeah. than just the light that time yeah because we so, so driving back out of the sherwood area uh as it was back then it, it it's like a little tiny mountain road and so in going through all these curves, you know, you couldn't see anything really on either side because there was a hill, uh, but then it just went over and wow. light and gone. Did you see a shape or anything or not really? <laughs> uh, not, you know, because of the roof of the car is really hard to see, um, but it did feel, no, I didn't actually see, see it. <laughs> mm, yeah. But it yeah. felt like disc like. Yeah. Wow. And have you ever seen anything else like that? Or is it that's your one your one sighting? That would have been my one sighting of a UFO. Yeah. One more than me anyway. So that's cool. <laughs> I mean, I have this memory of kind of seeing some stuff and I was with a friend and he kind of shares this vague memory, but I, I'm just so vague on it. I just don't uh, just remember a few lights kind of dancing around erratically. And I remember being freaked out. That's the main yeah. thing I remember. It's like 10, 15 years ago now. But the emotion of that kind of like, going from laughing and joking to oh okay i'm actually a little bit freaked <laughs> out that's on? what i remember that's what stuck with me the whole time um but yeah that's really cool okay did you have any did you have any other dreams of it after after you saw that oh gosh i mean i dreamt yeah i had multiple i had multiple dreams of ufos um but then and but as i have gotten older well mm -hmm. i still have had a couple but now it's changed to other things and so for example uh, if I see like some kind of a, of an animal, like I had, a, had a dream about an animal that was like a combination of, of kind of a, mm. a chicken and a zebra and something else. And it was outside on a tree and I was trying to take a picture of that and that, you know, that camera didn't work either. But I think the idea probably is more about, you know, me trying to capture some kind of a really special or magical moment that I can share, but then not being able to do that yeah you know yeah. it's like that seems to be the the feeling in in all of those dreams all around or you know but some something about just oh my gosh this is so cool and i really want to share it with people and i really want them to see it and yeah. you know and then just not having the ability to do it yeah i feel like everybody's probably had one dream like that where every it feels like so close to being you know it's like you're lined up you got the cam but just the button won't click or yes. something you don't get that rewarding moment where it's yeah, yeah you never <laughs> it's horrible why do they do that to us <laughs> Um, I've got another quote from your book here, uh, two of two, um, and it's kind of leading on to the the same kind of thing we've, we've just been talking about. So our life in this body is not eternal, but our life outside of it is. And dreams connect us to that timeless part of who we are. Mm. And there's a lot to unpack in that. I mean, there's two obviously questions that jump off the page is what do you believe or think happens after death, first mm. of all? And then the other one would be how is that? connected to our to our dreams mm. um but yeah so what do you think happens well i wish i could remember <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh but i do think i i think we go back to energy form uh so i think i think it's like you know the drop of water that goes back into the ocean Mm -hmm. So we come here and we, we have our experiences and we live our life and hopefully we evolve and we become more conscious or we become some kind of an express expression of, of, you know, uh, of source energy. And then we leave the body and then we reconnect with the larger source. That's what I think happens. Um, as to dreams, um, you know, if we, that would make us eternal, you know, like the quote, um, which also means though, that we would remember everything we've ever done, mm -hmm. um, everything we've ever been right. Like that would all somehow be part of our soul knowing. And 
in dreams, we probably have the ability, or it probably does happen that we do pull from some other information also, you know, that, that we have some access into that. But I, I think ultimately dreams are about bring, bringing us back into balance and bringing us back into wholeness. I think that they're about healing the soul. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, like we were talking earlier, I mean, it's, it's not always easy being on the planet and there's a lot going on and, you know, but, but we're, we are always trying to find a center place. Um, and I think that dreams help us to maintain, you know, an equilibrium. Yeah, no, definitely. So with the, the afterlife stuff, so you, th- you don't believe so much in a specific kind of reincarnation, like, uh, you know, somebody dies and then their, their soul will come back into another animal or another person or something. You think it's more of like a less attached, more detached, more of a kind of the energy goes out and, and that will just come back, whether it's as, you know, a gust of wind or a, a leaf, a tree. And... <laughs> no, I don't, I don't mean to sound flippant. I mean, like, uh, I just mean, yeah, that kind of just go into the the circle of life a little bit like lion king i guess in a way that like just everywhere and everything is that am i on track or no no i do actually believe in reincarnation okay um okay yeah so i mean i think yeah so we leave here we go up in energy form and then we decide whatever it is that we want to come back down oh you think we get to decide as well that's cool i think think that that. we make some kind of contract Mm -hmm. um and and i there's this, this book by Neil Donald Walsh, and it's a children's book, and it's called, um, oh gosh, I, I hope I get this right, the, the, the Little Soul in the Sun or something like that. And it's just the most beautiful story about this little soul who wants to um, experience forgiveness and wants to learn about forgiveness on earth. And, you know, because where he is, is, you know, everything's perfect there. And his very best friends offer to come with him. But, you know, the catch is and the rub is that they're going in order for him to learn forgiveness, they're going to have to give him reasons to forgive. So they're going to come here and they're going to end up being the people that hurt him the most. But right. it's because they love him so much there, you know, it's like in the heaven space that they would offer to come down and help him learn something that he wanted to learn. So it's a great story. Um, mm. But I think I think we do make a contract of some sort yeah. when we come in. Mm, yeah. Yeah. I've had that thought. I mean, I love, I love speculating about it. Cause it's just, it's, <laughs> I feel like there's nowhere near enough research into this subject. I know Robert Bigelow, like a, I think he's a billionaire American businessman. He's very interested in this topic and he's put a lot of money into researching it. And, and if only there were more people doing that um, and, and looking into it. Cause I think, yeah, it's, it's fascinating. Uh, we oh. really don't know a lot, do we? We really don't know why we're here what we are uh there's there's loads of things um leading very much on from that have you got any either direct experience or knowledge from other people of -of out-of-body experiences or near-death experiences Mm -hmm. you did kind of mention near-death experience earlier but have you ever had any first-hand experience with either of them i have not i have not um no and you know the people I've read about it. I've, you know, I've read a lot of books about it, uh, especially when yeah. I was younger. So I, I know that it happens. I think probably the most current person um, would be Anita Morjani, who I absolutely love. Um, she wrote a book. She's written two books, actually. Uh, the first one was called Dying to Be Me. And she uh, was dying of stage four cancer and literally left her body. And in her case, what's so fascinating, Ben, is the whole thing is completely documented because they have all the medical records about her. Mm -hmm. And I mean, there was no way she was going to survive and she left her body and she uh, saw her father and he said, look, it's not your time yet. And some things happened there. And then she comes back into her body and the cancer started healing within like within the very first week. And she ended up recovering a hundred percent from the cancer. And it was, you know, because of this, this experience and she came back and wrote about it and then shared about all this information from the other side. So yeah, it's, I mean, it's fascinating. It is so fascinating. It is. What was her name? Anita Morjani. It's M-O-O-R-J-A-N-I. 
Okay, cool. Yeah. I'm going to try and check that out. Oh, she's um, fast. She's got a, a lot of information on YouTube too. Lots and lots of cool. videos, but really fast. Have you, have, have you ever watched the Netflix show? Um, I think it was a book as well first, but I, I didn't re read the book yet. Uh, Surviving Death by Leslie Keen or Kane. No. I how to pronounce it. I didn't. You need to, have you got Netflix? You need to check I that have out it. for sure. Okay. Put it at the top of your watch list, uh, okay. Surviving Death. It, okay. It's, it's kind of a different episode into each, um, like different theories on it. Okay. So there's like an episode that looks at reincarnation. There's an episode that looks at near-death experiences. And I, I don't know whether it's the same episode of Alter's Body. Mm. There's an episode that looks at, I, I think, like mediums and things like that. There's some that's like sending signs from, there's lots. And it's just, it's, it's, it's looking at it from a kind of, scientific and just you know fairly sensible way of looking at it it's not kind of getting ahead of itself or anything like that mm -hmm. like the way i see it is the first documentary i've seen about something like that that kind of could appeal to the mainstream and kind oh, of get that people that are really <laughs> not into these topics but open to these topics in fact to be honest when i first watched it i was said to my girlfriend i was like yeah i watch it but i'm like not really buying into most of this stuff i think it's gonna be a load of, a load of nonsense and and there's a lot there that you're like okay that is really hard to dispute mm -hmm, um mm -hmm. it's really hard to to shit on it and it, mm -hmm. it's um yeah fascinating and it's totally piqued my interest since then um oh. do you be do you believe in extraterrestrial life do you think there's life off uh off our planet on any other planets or just life somewhere else i do. do do you think it would be connected do you think we would be connected or are connected to that life in the same way that all life on our planet is connected Ooh, that's a big question mm, i couldn't wait to ask you that one oh, right? <laughs> wow i've never been asked that question <laughs> I mean, obviously it's pure speculation, but it's just when I think <laughs> about it, I kind of, I guess I go kind of both ways. I mean, I do think there's definitely extraterrestrial yeah. life out there somewhere. And, and it makes sense that, yeah, if we are, if there's something going on on earth, some kind of, yeah, let's say reincarnation system where we, we get a contract. We're like, yeah, I'm going to go down and do that. And, mm -hmm. and I'll come back after and I'll try something else. If there's that kind of system in place, are we in some kind of coalition with, with other plant, like, you know, the other life systems and, Ah, uh, yeah, it's uh, it's, it's mind spinning. <laughs> well, I would. It is. It is mind spinning. Uh, but I think you know, if if there is some universal source of everything, then that would all be included, right? Mm. Like, I don't think that there would be just you know a, a god source for planet Earth only, and it and it's you know and it only only is defined on on our little planet. It would have to be something. There's too much big stuff out there, you know. Mm -hmm. And like you said, there's so much stuff we don't know. Uh, so we would have to be connected somehow. I think. Yeah. I don't know how, <laughs> but no. but that would... the idea. <laughs> The idea of being connected is just as, it's like it, whether it's out there or not. The idea yeah. of being connected to that is just as terrifying as not being connected. <laughs> um, like they're both like, yeah, horrifically scary thoughts in, the, in their weird way. Um, <laughs> yeah, but it's a fascinating thing to think about. Yeah, for sure. I, I love thinking about that. Um, are you, have you been... Book, ben. <laughs> <laughs> it would. Have you kept up to date with like um, the UAPs and stuff? Because, you know, that's the new name for UFOs. So have you have you watched any of the, uh, you know, the news on these things? Oh, yeah. Um, oh, I'm still fascinated yeah. by it. I, I will yeah. watch anything that comes out on that. Yeah, and what's interesting <laughs> is there's a lot of activity going on as at least in, you know, as is being reported. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, very much so. And I think there's a lot more that's not being reported. But from from what like that you've heard of it from from that, do you, if you want to go out on a limb and say it, do you, I mean, do you have any concept of what you think the UAPs are? Do you think it's as simple as life from another planet coming here to visit? Or do you think there's more to it? Because I know there's, everybody's got a theory and some people think they're future humans. Some people think they're interdimensional or extra dimensional. Some people think they're simply extraterrestrial, which to me seems like the, 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 the least difficult to comprehend answer of all of them. Of course, it could be terrestrial tech, you know, our secret tech on Earth which would again be scarier to me than it being extraterrestrials i think um that we would have this leap in technology that nobody knows about so right. have you got a theory on it not really i mean i i would lean more towards um you know the interdimensional piece of it i think is interesting because you do have to wonder they mm. you know they they appear and they disappear so 
how does that work? You know? Yeah. So I think it's very possible that, that that's a realm that they're in by the mm. same token. I also feel like they, the, the extraterrestrial, you know, being just from someplace else and having the ability to, to move here or, you know, fly here or whatever, um, is highly likely. So yeah, I don't know. That's a big question. Yeah. I mean, the, in all likelihood, it's quite probably more than one, you know, more than one yeah. thing. Like if we looked at all the sightings of UFOs, probably some of them are weather, probably some of them are non-classified tech. Some of them are classified tech. And then, yeah, some of them may be visitors from somewhere else. Um, where that somewhere else is, is, is anybody's guess, I suppose, for now. Well, and I, but I, and I will say one thing that I think might tie into this. I remember that, you know, some of the first sightings were right after, or at least reported sightings were right after the atomic bomb. Mm, yeah. um, and, you know, for them to show up at a time like that, to me would imply that there is a concern that you know, if we blow up planet earth, right. Which I guess mm -hmm. we could probably do many times over with all the weaponry <laughs> that exists in the bombs. Yeah. It would throw the whole solar system out of whack and completely. Mm -hmm. And who knows what our little solar system of planets affects in the larger scheme, you know, outside of it. So, cause we don't know, right. It, it's like my personal actions. How does that affect anybody in, in, you know, Russia yeah. or whatever. Yeah. Uh, so but that I, makes sense to me. Yeah. That that's why they would have shown up then. Um, are you familiar with Dr. John Mack? No. Uh, no. Okay. You're going to love him. Um, okay. He was a Harvard, a Harvard professor. You should watch my episode with Ralph Blumenthal. He did a biography okay. of John Mack recently. So he was a Harvard professor of psychiatry, I think, mm. that it, it kind of after you know becoming very successful and renowned and, and you know adored, he went on to develop an interest into things like alien abductions and holotropic breathing and and all sorts of out there topics um life after death as well uh, that kind of thing um i think he looked into dreams and things as well um but he was really into all these topics and um he found that a lot of his he called them experiences the people that told them him that they had been abducted by aliens uh he said a lot of these people would report they were being shown images or given messages that we're destroying the planet and we need to stop what we're doing. And, you know, whether it's from a new, he was, he himself was an a, a activist against nuclear mm. weapons and things like that. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of parallels and there's a lot of things that make sense there. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. we'd be very lucky, obviously, if that's why an alien race have decided to come here is to just look after us. That would be the, the best case scenario, I guess, um, <laughs> as long as the, the answer for them isn't just to exterminate us. Uh, well, uh, or, yeah. <laughs> like the Twilight Zone, there was one Twilight Zone where they came and they're all excited because, you know, they're loading people up and taking them to another planet and. Uh, you know, there's somebody's trying to decipher the words in this book that they gave them and it's called to serve mankind and they're all excited about it. And, you know, and then it turns out that it's a, um, a recipe book. <laughs> mm. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's, uh, that's the worst case. Yeah, the worst case. <laughs> Um, but no, I find it fascinating. And I think there's probably or possibly, I won't say probably for this, but possibly, yeah, some kind of connection with with dreams and all that. I think it's all probably connected in some way to consciousness, whatever somebody wants to call that soul or consciousness or inner self or I don't know, there's probably many words for it. But yeah, I think it's all kind of stems from that. I think there's there's lots of connection there. Yeah, um, maybe, maybe I'm way off base, but that's my thing. Mm -hmm. um, so this was interesting. I didn't know we'd we'd go quite this deep into these topics, but that was fun. That was um, fun. So I, just to finish it out here, if there's any kind of message you want to send to anybody that's listening or watching or multiple messages, if you want, if there's any, any words of wisdom or just whatever you want to say, no pressure. Um, oh. The floor is yours if, if you want to. Gosh, well, I, 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 I think my biggest message would just be there is so much available to us in the dream time that we're not aware of. And I really just encourage anybody who has any kind of an interest in, in dreams at all, just start playing around with it and do it for fun. You know, it doesn't have to be a big heavy thing. Just start, just start writing down what you dream and start seeing what shows up because you never know 
right? Unless you open the door. And um, I've just found so much benefit and so much, you know, just personal healing from my own dream work over the years. And I think that dreams are really one of our fastest ways to consciousness, Mm -hmm. not just personally, but collectively. So if everybody were to pay attention to their dreams, I think we, we just would have so many more opportunities for, for healing on the planet. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. And and I guess some people listening would, they'll be thinking things like precognitive dreams and healing dreams, like, no, I'm out. But I, th- I guess to people like that, you don't need to just be out on the whole subject, right? You you just, like you just said, just just take a bit of interest in it. I mean, at the end of the day, it's your brain. So take a bit of interest in what's what it's saying to you and just look at it. That's what you have to do, right? Uh, and that's what I'm going to start doing a lot more of as well after you're reading your book, which is going to be linked in the description and all that kind of thing for anybody else, uh, anybody that wants to, to find that um, or, or any other links regarding Bambi. Thank you. Cool. All right, Bambi, this was a lot of fun. Um, really, really interesting stuff. Thank you. And ben. I'm looking forward to hopefully remembering my dreams tomorrow. <laughs> I hope you do too. You love me well. <laughs> Thank you very much. Take Thank care. You. Okay. Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening to my conversation with Bambi Corso Steinmeier. I hope you enjoyed it and I hope it gives you powerful dreams. If either of those ends up being true, please consider subscribing. Please check out all of Bambi's and our links in the description. Be nice, be happy, be cool.